for treating signs and symptoms, it'll be, uh, I think that's probably more something more difficult that the law enforcement has to deal with the ever-changing uh, uh, chemical compositions of these things. Commander, actually, while you're at the podium, um, I wanted to ask something really quick. I, you know, I want to get a better sense of how these people are treated because I guess like they're just ingesting poison. So does that mean that you guys are pumping their stomachs? Are you also giving them certain kinds of medication? Are they dealing with more intense symptoms that have to be treated with, I don't know, surgery or something There's, like there's that? no standard way that we treat these, uh, this patient population because if they're presenting as uh, with a seizure, then we're gonna treat the seizure. If they're presenting with uh, catatonic uh, conditions, then we're gonna try to uh, manage their airway and see how their vital signs are responding. So we're basically just treating signs and symptoms. There is no standard way that you treat uh, uh, the uh, the users of these chemicals. And so it's my, yeah, it, it was said that there's only one person who has died from K2. Uh, have any, has anyone else like lost brain function or had other, you know, life altering uh, things happen to them because of K2? We suspect that there has. However, um, unless you can track these patients all the way through the hospital system to discharge, then that is a challenge for law enforcement, that's a challenge for EMS to even speak to how, how severe um, some of these patients. We do know that speaking with one of the hospital administrators or one of the hospital staff that they're, they're quickest from discharge to readmission from a patient was 30 seconds. Um, they walked out, take, they took another hit, and then they were right back inside the, uh, the hospital again. So we do know that, and that, that is speaking to um, one of the uh, hospital physicians who, who conveyed that to us. But again, you know, it, it's a problem. And, and, sorry, go ahead. and sorry, my last question is, how do you know they're not just um, losing consciousness and they're fine? For this guy, I mean, like, is it kind of a situation where it could be worst case scenario, so you have to treat them, but they may actually be fine in some cases? They're usually not fine. And, um, and, and because they're, because why? Because of the way um, they're behaving, they're presenting, their signs and symptoms. I mean, sometimes they could be, with, they could present with high blood pressure, they could present with low blood pressure, you know, high heart rate, low heart rate, they could be uh, combative, they could be catatonic. So you're looking at, both ends of the spectrum for all, for these patients. So it is a, a wide variety of, uh, of changes in these patients. You mentioned it's not just a homeless problem. Can you talk about the other populations you're seeing? I know that it's, men, it's uh, marketed as synthetic marijuana. So is it a lot of children or teenagers or college students? What you're seeing? We're seeing, uh, obviously we've talked about this before, that the highest concentration of patients we see are in the downtown area, but it's not isolated to it. We're seeing it throughout the county. And and ages of people, young people, and various ages of uh, age ranges and various degrees of um, uh, financial uh, income and uh, background. So I mean, and law enforcement could probably speak to even more so, you know, more specifics on that. Could is there any way somebody from law enforcement could just talk about the difficulty as this drug keeps changing? I know um, Captain Benavides was saying that it probably would be sure. something better for you guys to talk about. Well, as Commander Officer said, you know, if we find you with what we believe to be cocaine or crack cocaine, we have test kits, field test kits, you know, that can test for the substance and tell us from a presumptive test what it probably is. You can't do that with K2 because it's, it's no specific substance. The lab, uh, which Commander Officer said has done a great job for us testing these, these items that we seize, has a wide gamut of things that they have to search for to see if, if they're present in order to call it K2. And so, us on the streets, you know, if you, you arrest a person for whatever and you search them incidental to arrest and you find what may be K2, you can't charge them with it. You have to turn it into the lab to be tested. Once it's tested, then detectives can file a warrant for the person, but it, it takes several months, you know, for that to happen. Do you think there's a way to get ahead of this or is it kind of you're learning as you go? We're always learning as we go. You know, I, I don't know if it will ever be possible for science to create a test kit for K2, given the fact that it's not a specific substance. It's a, a mix of chemicals that come together, cause a reaction in the body. And, and so whether or not there will ever be a test kit for that, I don't know. But what the legislature did do is uh, 2015, <clears throat> yes, in 2015, our legislature uh, passed some updates to the analog drug. So before, it, if it didn't meet, the way they got around the law is, say we're use water, H2O, they'd add another oxygen mole molecule onto it. Well, 
if you add another molecule onto it, it's still an analog. So in 2015, the legislature finally caught up, we caught up with the scientists and they passed an analog rule. So if it's even close, it falls in. So now we have the tool to do the test. It's just a process that you can't get around. Legally, we have the tools now that if you change the product and it's still the base formula, we can do what we need to do. But the science of it is, is that it has to be tested to at least be specific of this is what it contains. Commander Officer, could you please identify yourself? You didn't do that at the beginning. My name is, I thought I was world famous. So. <laughs> you are. My name is Troy Officer. Last name is Officer, O-F-F-I-C-E-R, and I'm the commander of our Organized Crime Division. So if it takes a couple months, um, I guess, to get that charge in with the lab results, are these people, I guess, still on the streets and possibly delivering more cases? When we make an arrest, uh, if, it's, if it's another charge, they're in jail on that charge. Uh, if it's simply a K2 thing, we seize the evidence, test it, and they're released until we can come back with a warrant and then they're picked up later. Uh, the legal process is always a step behind the other process and that's just the world we live in. Do you believe that you're closing in on the ringleader of this? We are working diligently with federal and other uh, partners as well as international partners. Um, this, is, this is trying to stop a flood with a teaspoon. Um, tomorrow there will be another drug that we'll be after as hot and heavy. Uh, we're bound to do what we can with this one. I would love to say that we could put a stop to it and I'd be the richest man in the world and figure out that, but all we can do is do our best and, uh, and roll with the punches. And you're saying international, are you talking about the FBI? Like who are these international and national agencies you're working Most with? of these drugs that are coming to us are coming from China. And uh, so we're working with the FBI as well as uh, HSI to try to uh, get cooperation with, because what it takes to make these drugs are not illegal in other countries. And with the internet, you can order whatever you need from anywhere. And that in and of itself may or may not be uh, illegal, but we're we're trying to swim further upstream to stop the flow as opposed to on the bottom end where we're just constantly in the vicious cycle, but the wheels of justice turn slowly, but I guarantee you they are turning. I just have one more question, sorry for me personally. Um, how much did the um, upcoming South by Southwest play into the urgency of getting these people off the streets? What played into the urgency of getting these people off the street were the 50 overdoses we had on Thanksgiving. Um, quite honestly and personally, I'm sick and tired of reading about, I get a call from Justin and on a Friday evening saying, hey man, we just got hit again. EMS has made 50 runs. My guys are swamped. What can we do? Um, now it played a part in doing it before South by Southwest because I don't have to wait another month to get these guys off the street because I can't do it during South by because we'll be stretched so thin. But what played the most part in getting this done was our, our Thanksgiving overdoses. So do people buy the ingredients from China and then make it over here, or do they buy it from China and then distribute it here? They buy the ingredients from outside the country and they make it here and they make dollars on the pennies invested. These guys who make this drug are predators. They're in it for the money and, and, and no other reason. And they could care less about the health of the general public, whether they be school children, school teachers, homeless folks, or police officers. So are you guys tracking like web sales of some of these ingredients or? Oh, I hope that? to be standing before you soon with another press conference <laughs> and have an answer to all your questions. <laughs> Hopefully with some folks that speak another language next to me saying that they're working with us. I have a question. Um, you mentioned Arch. Uh, I know that there's also a huge homeless population in South Austin around Ben White, Lamar, that area. Are we seeing uh, a lot of K2 arrests in that area as well? The, there's probably arrests all over the city, but most of the K2 responses are medical calls as opposed to arrests. Uh -huh. So we were driven to this by the sure pinpointed location for medical calls. Um, because otherwise it's probably just a PI, mm -hmm. but most PIs don't die or kill people or fight in the process of being treated. So they're happening in other, arts, other parts of the city as medical calls, and it's not 
not as concentrated as we have downtown, which is why for this particular one, it was focused downtown. I imagine you concur with that, right? Yes. Um, yes, I do concur um, with that. Um, as far as the city is concerned, we also have a uh, not as high uh, incident number, but we do see a higher uh, incident uh, than any other part of the county other than downtown towards the transition center. So those are the two, those are the two spots that we see the highest uh, concentration of these incidents. Okay, thank you. Of all these people on this chart, is there anyone who's a pretty major dealer, like dealing to dealers? Well, it's hard to say as far as the ones that are on the chart right now, because most of the people that you see on here are either users or low level people that just happen to pass it off or whatever the case may be. Um, the major people, the distributors and such, again, those are people who aren't necessarily in the Austin area, but that's why we're working with agencies on the federal level, state level, and local level in other cities. Do you suspect, what area do you suspect they are in? All over. <laughs> They're basically all over. I mean, you can look all over the country. We're getting hit. Large major cities are getting their, their emergency services. They're overburdened because these people are coming in. The reality is these people that are making this stuff, they don't care about us. They don't care about these people that they call clients. They can mix them with anything in this stuff. They take it. All of a sudden now we have a call. EMS has to go on. So we've got to keep that in mind as a society. These people are in the business of making money. That's their ultimate goal. They don't care about other people. We'll take one last question. These 21 outstanding warrants um, for these people, are they considered dangerous at all? Or are they still delivering? Or just what's kind of the outstanding warrants for them? Well, they're first degree felonies, which are, they're on the higher end of the spectrum as far as pickups. Um, most of these people, the reality is, they're gonna come back to the downtown area. The DTAC officers, they've always been directly involved with this roundup as well as the previous one. So they're gonna be on the lookout for these people because they're gonna also have their pictures in their own little packets because we hand them out during the roundups. 